you and are being in a, found in a position where we can be used by you. Father, we ask for special help because these are instructions for life that we need help on. And as we become uh, representatives for you in a world that uh, has rejected you, uh, we know the challenges uh, that that brings and we know that the opposition is great. And all that he throws at us can be a challenge. We're thankful, Father, that you've given us more than we need uh, to be overcomers and to allow uh, the Lord Jesus to be victorious in our life. We ask for your special help as we go through this uh, next session that, uh, you know, the day can be long, but we ask for help as we stay focused. And, uh, Father, may you be glorified uh, this afternoon. We ask for help for Tim. Uh, keep him refreshed, keep him energized, and allow him to uh, speak as a mouthpiece for you, we pray. All this giving you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. It's all yours. Well, good afternoon. One, one last time. Good afternoon. All right. So I'm going to ask you this afternoon to take your Bibles and turn with me back to the book of Leviticus. And I'm on a, I want to look, we've been comparing and contrasting, looking at the distinction between the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood that we've been brought into. And this afternoon, I'd like to look, with the Lord's help, at Leviticus chapter 8 and chapter 9, chapter 10. Three chapters that set forth a lot of practical teaching for us as we can learn them from the Levites as they, the consecration and even the, the first mistake that seems to be made there. So if you will, Leviticus chapter 8, and we made this statement at the outset of our time together. And this is why we want to look at these verses, these chapters. We made the statement at the outset that as Leviticus is to the book, to the Old Testament, so is the book of Hebrews to the New Testament. And so when we look at the, these, uh, the book of Leviticus, as we had in the very first lesson today, the book of Leviticus is the book of approach. It is where much of what was commanded in the book of Exodus concerning the tabernacle and the priestly service, it's now fulfilled in the book of Leviticus. It was given to Moses, to Aaron, in the book of Exodus, but it's fulfilled in the book of Leviticus, particularly in chapter 8 and chapter 9. And so we want to give some attention there. We saw in the first seven chapters, and I'm not going to reiterate too much on, on that, but we saw in the first seven chapters of Leviticus the way of approach. And then we're going to see now, starting at chapter 8, the actual approach. And as the priests begin, we saw that it begins in the book of Leviticus, chapter 1, with the, uh, with the burnt offering, and then follows the meal offering, follows the peace offering, follows the sin offering and the trespass offering, and, and then the laws of each of those offerings. That's all in the first seven chapters. And it, and it really uh, reminds us that the sinner, as C.H. McIntosh once said, the sinner needs a sacrifice and the believer needs a priest. And this is what we have in these verses. Once again, not clicking. So we'll leave that to you folks. So the sacrifices of, here we go, and one more. Beautiful. So the, the sacrifices of chapters 1 through 7 speak of, of Christ as uh, the sacrifice and when we look at Aaron in chapter 8, beginning at chapter 8, we see that Aaron speaks of 
the Lord Jesus Christ as our priest. So when you look at Aaron in Scripture, you see an example or a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as our high priest. Therefore, Aaron's children are a picture of every believer. And so when we look at this, this is important for us to, to, to look at. And what's interesting is in starting in chapter 9, the focus changes where we find the consecration of Aaron in, in chapter 8 and of the other priests in chapter 8, the focus changes from Moses to Aaron. And so we want to just sort of lay that as the groundwork as we begin to look at these chapters. So then Aaron and his sons are consecrated in chapter 8. So as you look at chapter 8, and I'm not going to read all the verses there in chapter 8. I'm going to sum summarize, and I'm going to trust that you read those chapters so that you can familiarize yourself and see if what I'm saying is according to the Scripture and look, it at, look up the Scriptures and see. But what we find is we begin to look at chapter 8, and we learn several things concerning the priesthood. The first thing that we learn is an interesting expression. I think I alluded to this earlier in the first lesson today, and, and that is this, that everything was done as the Lord commanded Moses. When you look at chapter 8, it says, look at verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, and then verse 4, And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. Verse 5, this is what the Lord commanded to be done. Verse 9, as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 13, as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 17, as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 21 at the end, as the Lord commanded Moses. And you could go straight through and you could see that in all of these chapters that we're looking at, over and over and over again, this expression, as the Lord commanded Moses. Everything is done according to the mind of the Lord. And I think that is an extremely important point. The word of the Lord takes a precedent place. The word of the Lord takes not only a prominent place, but it takes the preeminent place in the life of the priest. And this is important. If I am going to function as a priest for the glory of God, the word of God has to have a preeminent place in my life. If the word of God does not have a preeminent, preeminent place in my life, I am not going to be able to say, I've done everything according to the word of God. I'm not going to be able to say, thus saith the Lord. And so how important it is that we underline this point as you see in repetition. And let me tell you something. In Scripture, when you see something that's repeated over and over again, like this expression, as the Lord commanded Moses, it isn't there just to fill up space. It isn't there just for repetition's sake. It's there for a purpose. And it's there to underline a point. And for us, the point is, the Word of God has to have an important point, in, a, a part in my life. I need to be able to follow what the Word of God says. For example, in his high priestly ministry, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his high priestly, what we call the high priestly prayer, in John chapter 17, in fact, if you want to just turn there, for a moment. Keep your finger here. We're coming back. But in John chapter 17, I want to just allude to a couple of verses there. In John chapter 17, and I believe it's starting at verse 14. John 17, verse 14, he says, I have given them, this is the Lord Jesus praying to the Father. And he says this, I have given them your word, 
And the word, the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray for them that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. How? Here it comes. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This underlines and emphasizes for us the point that we're trying to make here is that the word of God must take precedence in our life. And if I am not in the word, I will not be able to function as a holy priest or as a royal priest. If I'm not digging it out and looking at it, and, 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 and uh, digging for things in the word of God and siphoning it through and, and listening to it and, and letting it, you know, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If I'm not digging out the treasures of God's word, then I'm not going to be able to function as a priest in this world. I'm not going to be set apart. I'm not going to be sanctified. I'm not going to be uh, that which is set apart for a purpose, which is what the word sanctification means. So how important it is for us to take the word of God as treasure in our souls. And it isn't about how much of the word I have or how much I'm in the word as much as it is how much does the word have me and how much of the word is in me? See, it isn't about so much me getting into the word as it might puff me up, but it's how much of the word is really changing my life. See, it's one thing to have the word come in through your eyes and into your head. But what we're talking about, this work of sanctification to work in my heart. It's got to come down from my understanding, my knowledge, and it's got to come into my heart where it pricks my conscience, yes, but also affects my heart. Because where your heart is, there shall your treasure also be, Scripture says. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he, Scripture says. So what's in my heart is that which owns my heart. And if the word of God is in my heart, then I have affection for the word of God. I've made mention of this on numerous times, and I'll make mention of it again. I asked Brother Grant Steidel years ago, 40-some years ago, when I first went into the Lord's work, I asked Brother Grant, I said, Brother Grant, how can I be a good servant? How can I be a full, good full-time worker? How can I be helpful to the Lord's people? He said, I'm going to tell you two things. He said, number one, ask the Lord to give you a love for the people of God. And number two, ask the Lord to give you a love for the word of God. A love for the word of God and a love for the people of God. And every day for the past 40 years, when I wake up, it's the first thing I pray. I ask the Lord, give me a love for your word today. Give me a love for your people today. I don't know if you know this. Sometimes we're not the most lovable people. You know? You know how it goes. Oh, to dwell with Christ above. Oh, that will be glory. But to dwell with the saints below, that's a whole nother story. And sometimes it is that way. But if I see Christ in you, I love Christ. If I see him in you, 
I love you. That's what we need, brothers and sisters. We got to stop looking at each other and stop seeing all the faults and the warts and, and everything else that's on us. The stuff that we picked up in this world. We got to stop looking at each other through these eyes and look at one another through the eyes of Christ. And so, the Word of God helps us do that. The Word of God, as I am in the Word and, and I'm washing and I'm being renewed by the Word of God, and my mind is being renewed. My heart is the affection of my heart. I'm setting my affection on things above because I'm in the Word. And as the Word of God is making an impact in my life, then it brings us to this next thing that we see. It's interesting that the second ingredient to this priesthood, if you look down at verse chapter 8, verse 14 and 15, what we see there. The second ingredient to the priesthood is important, the importance of the blood that is mentioned. It's mentioned in verses 14 and 15. It's mentioned again in verses 18 to 19. It's mentioned again in verses 22 to 24. First, we, we see that uh, as we look at the, the meaning of this, the blood is put on the right ear. It speaks of being consecrated to listening to divine communications. Stop listening to the world and have an ear that is consecrated as a priest of God. My ears need to be consecrated to hear what the Word of God says and what God himself is saying. I need to stop listening to the voices of this world and start hearing the voices of the shepherd. He says, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. I want to hear the voice of the shepherd. I want to hear the voice of the Lord. I want to close off my ears to the things of this world and I want to just say, speak, Lord, like Samuel. Young Samuel, oh, if I had a heart like Samuel, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. That's what I want. And so we need our ears, the blood placed on, on, in consecration, that our ears would be open. It reminds us of the blessed Lord Jesus. When we look in Isaiah 50, it says that his ears were open daily to receive as a learner. Think of that. The Lord Jesus himself, it speaks of, in the, in the servant song in Isaiah 15, it speaks of the Lord Jesus having ears open to hear as a learner. The word learner there, same word as disciple in the New Testament. The Lord Jesus is the perfect disciple. He's the perfect learner. His ears were open daily, morning and at night, he says. His ears were open. Isaiah 50, starting at verse 4 there, going down. And so how wonderful to see that the blood on the ear speaks of consecration. The blood on the right hand, as we find it there in verses 18 to 19, it speaks of, of uh, consecrated service or work that should be done in the sanctuary, in the presence of, of the Lord, that which is consecrated. You know, we use our hands for so many things. But he says, put your hands to the plow. Put your hands to that which has eternal value. Put your hands to the things of God that are going to last. Because everything in this life you can't take with you. Except you can take souls with you. You know that? I was talking to somebody once and, and we were talking about this and their theology wasn't very good because they said, well, when the rapture takes place, I'm going to grab a sinner in this hand and a sinner in that hand and I'm going to grab them both and I'm going to halfway up, I'm going to say, you guys going to get saved or do I let go? Well, that, that, that theology doesn't quite, it's not biblical, Right? But the, really, the only thing we take with us, the Word of God is going to last forever. And the souls 
How about starting at home? Putting your hands to that work of saving lost members in your family. How about putting your hands to the work of the assembly? You know, it's easy. Listen, young people, I'm going to tell you something. It's so easy to sit around and find fault with the older brethren. Don't worry, none of, none of the older brethren are listening to me right now. It's, it's easy to find fault with our older brethren. It's easy to find fault with decisions that are made or traditions or whatever it is. But listen, put your hands to that work. Go alongside an older brother and learn from him. Go alongside an older brother and say, listen, I hear you have a hospital ministry or you have a ministry in the nursing home. Can, can I go with you? One of the greatest decisions I ever made was to go with Brother Ed Van Ryan to the nursing home. I learned so much from that brother. We were walking down a, a hallway and there was a sister we were going to go visit. L Liddy Dukanoy was her name. She was over 100 years old. She's laying in the bed. And we could hear her all the way down. We, we came to visit her. But we could hear her all the way down. And, and we started walking down the hallway. And as we walked down the hallway, it got louder and louder and louder. And she was hollering. And you know how it happens sometimes. She was just, ah, like this. And the closer we got, the louder it got. And we walked into the room and it was, oh my goodness, it was loud. And Ed, Brother Ed walked up to her. And he started rubbing her forehead. He said, Lydia, the Lord Jesus is here. The Lord Jesus is here. Soon you're going home to be with the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus. And he kept saying the name Jesus. The name of Jesus is a bomb in Gilead. And he kept saying the name Jesus. And he kept, kept coaxing her forehead and, and, and just rubbing her forehead and and this loud shrieking noise way up here, it just went like this. And pretty soon, I, I thought of that scripture, you know, the man was in his right mind. There she was, quiet. We left that room. I learned so much from that brother. Present Jesus to the saints. And the saints will be encouraged and built up in their most holy faith. You see, young people, it's easy to find fault. I think of the, uh, of, of the sons of the prophets. And they said, listen, this place here, it's too small for us. We want something new. <laughs> Enough of this. Let's go. We're going to go and build something new. Somebody in that group was smart. Somebody in that group had something going on. Because they said, Elisha, will you go with us? And Elisha had enough insight and wisdom to say, yes, I'll go. Older brethren, if a young person asks you to be a part of their work, get involved. And Elisha says, oh, yes, I'll go with you. Good thing. Because a young the young brother, in all of his zeal, in all of his energy, he's there and he's chopping away and he's just going to town on that. And all of a sudden, the axe head falls into the water. And he says, oh, alas, master, it was borrowed. And Elisha knew exactly what to do. We need our older brethren. Don't write them off. And... and Older brethren, don't write off the younger brother. We need one another. This manner of putting your hands to the work, consecration. And then notice this. It, the, it says the right foot, blood on the right foot speaks of consecration that's needed in one's conduct as he serves. And Aaron and his sons, by laying their hands upon the sacrifice, they all understood before God the value of this same sacrifice. It was identification. Notice the third thing. Verses 5 and 6. 
It stands out there. Aaron and his sons were washed, it says. And, and it reminds us of, of the words of the Lord Jesus, of how we need to be washed in the word again. And then down in, in verses 7 through 12, what we read there is Aaron is presented alone. The anointing oil was poured upon his head. Notice, too, that this oil was used to anoint the tabernacle and all that was in it. And so Aaron here is a type of Christ who's offered himself upon the cross. And he did this work entirely alone. That's why Aaron is presented alone. This would remind us of the baptism of the Lord Jesus when he was anointed for service in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, verses 13 to 17. But now look at chapter 8, verse 30 and 35. There we read that once there has been shed blood, Aaron and his sons would be anointed together on the ground of that shed blood. Aaron's sons being anointed would remind us of what we have in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, when the Holy Spirit came down on resurrection morning. The Holy Spirit comes down. And so when we think about this, I tell you, There we go. When we look at all of this in this chapter, and then we think of in chapter 9, this priestly service begins. I'm encouraged as I see this. this there's a prophetic picture here in this chapter. No doubt, but I, I want to make some very practical applications as we look at this. I want to draw our attention to the very first verse of chapter 9. It says, it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. Eight is a number of new beginnings in Scripture. When we think of the eighth day, it speaks to us of resurrection morning. The eighth day. The eighth day symbolizes a resurrection life. Living in the good of a resurrected life. And again, there's an extremely important lesson here concerning priestly service. And that is this, that we cannot function as a priest. You and I cannot function as a holy priest or as a royal priest if I'm not in the good of the resurrected life. If I'm not living in a resurrected life. If that same power that raised up the Lord Jesus from among the dead, which now lives in me, if that isn't a living reality in my life, I cannot be a holy priest or a royal priest in reality. I am, but we're talking about practicality. We're talking about beyond position. We're talking about our practice. This matter of the resurrected life. I think it's beautiful to see in Ephesians chapter 1. When the Apostle Paul is talking about this resurrected life. From verse 18 to verse 20. He uses four different words to describe the power that raised up the Lord Jesus from among the dead. He uses four different words to describe that power. Because one word wasn't going to do it enough. He used the word for power that means dynamite. He used the word for power that means energy. He used the power for means working, something working, moving forward. He uses four different words for this idea of power. So that we would get some kind of inkling of an idea. That the power of God. This same power is what came down on the day of Pentecost. And this same power has baptized me into the body of Christ once. One time thing. This same power anoints us for service could be ongoing. This same power, the power of the Spirit of God, 
is the power in which we function as Christians today. So often, here I go on that limb again, but so often, we don't know much about resurrected power. We're so used to doing things the same way. This is the way my dad did it. This is the way my grandfather did it. This is the tradition. This is the way we do things here in this assembly. I'm getting close to meddling, aren't I? We wonder sometimes why the assemblies aren't making an impact in people's lives. Why aren't our communities changing? We've been here for so long. Why, why isn't people coming? Maybe we've just been going through the motions. And this resurrected power life as a priest isn't there. I'm not against tradition. I like tradition. My wife will tell you. Sometimes I purposely drive a different way to work, or to work, to meeting. Sorry about that. Sometimes I drive a, a different way on purpose just to break my tradition because I'm, I'm one of these guys that I'll be one of the old brothers that say, well, we've never done it that way before. Right? So I try to, I try to go a different way to meeting just so that I don't fall into that rut. By the way, you know what a rut is? It's a grave with the ends kicked out. That's what a rut is. I borrowed that from Brother Russ Scaling. He used to always say that. But you know what, brothers and sisters? We need this resurrected power. We don't need to rely on tradition. You know, it, it's great that the older brethren did that. It's great. Nothing against that. I need to make things mine today. I need to live in the resurrected power. I need to be able to say, not because brother so-and-so says so, but because the word of God says so. Here's chapter and verse right there. There it is. This is why we do what we do. And the power in which we do it. I asked a, one, I asked a brother one time, why is it that, that we cover up the bread and the wine at the end of the meeting? Why do we do that? We cover it up. Why do we do that? And he says, well, you see, because the Lord has gone away and we don't see him anymore and he's gone. I said, well, what do you do with, what do you do with Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9? By faith we see him. What do you do with that? He said, well, yeah. But, uh... And I said, isn't the reason we cover it up because there used to be flies, the windows used to be open, so we used to have flies everywhere, and so we cover it up so the flies don't get it? Isn't that why we did it? Oh, yeah, I think that's probably it. And I said, so that's tradition. Well, yeah. I said, okay. That's fine. I don't try to spiritualize it. I don't try to make something out of it that it's, uh, whatever. Right? I mean, let's be real. Let's live in the, in, the, in the resurrected power. That's what I'm saying. And if people see Christ alive in me, what difference will it make? If they see Christ alive in you, and they see Christ alive in us as an assembly, and they see priests not only consecrated, to hear God's word. Consecrated to do God's work. Consecrated to walk in God's ways. Consecrated to move forward in the power of resurrected life. The eighth day. Wow. What an impact we could make. I think that's what's missing in our lives. So, Coming back then, the eighth day, we look in our chapter, we see that Aaron 
we drop down a little bit. And we see in verses 2 to 14 that Aaron had to offer a sacrifice for himself first. We see this in, in verses 2 to 14 of chapter 9. But, but as we see, as we have seen our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, he did not need to offer a sacrifice for himself. That's why he's much more than Aaron. But then we see when all was done, according to God's mind, he could bless with power and his presence. Chapter 9, verse 15 to 21, 24. And in these closing verses, we see the result of this priesthood, what this result of our priesthood ought to be. Notice that it says there was blessing for the people. Blessing for the people. That's what ought to come out of priestly lives. Blessing for the people of God. The people of, the people of God are blessed when we function as God's priests. Notice that in verse 22 and 23. And then notice this. Another characteristic, another feature of this priestly service is that people were in awe. Notice it in verse 24 of chapter 9. It says there at the end, For fire came down from before the Lord and consumed the offering and the fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. There was such a reverential awe that God was in this place, that God was at work. It was the power of God working in these priests. There was reverence. There was a reality. Listen to me. There was a reality of the presence of God in that place. I think oftentimes in the early church there was a reality of the presence of God. But I think oftentimes in our life there's a this is missing. This is missing. The presence that, that where two or three are gathered unto my name there I am in the midst. We don't come to gather with the brethren. We don't come to gather on tradition. What brings me to this table tomorrow, what brings me here, my Lord said, where two or three are gathered unto my name, there I am in the midst of them. That's what brings me here. There's a reality. When God is present in a place, when God is at work, there ought to be a holy reverence. And then I'll just say this in closing. I'm borrowing my 10 minutes from before. Since I landed the plane early last time, I'm going to just fly it a little bit longer. When you turn into Nadab and Abihu in chapter 10, I won't spend a lot of time there, but they offered strange fire. I don't know what that strange fire was. Scripture does not say. It doesn't do us any good to try to figure it out. Except this. It wasn't according to God's mind. They tried to worship in a way that wasn't according to to God's mind. They offered strange fire that wasn't prescribed by God. And the result was they were consumed. Think of that. It says they were struck dead. And there's Aaron. These are Aaron's two sons. And when you look at the other two sons of Aaron, it looks like in Scripture, as you trace it through, it looks like they learned from that. There was a holy reverence. But when you look at Aaron himself, 
Aaron knew what was done was wrong. He knew that God had judged. He didn't say to God, look, these were my sons. What did you do this for? Aaron accepted it. You read, the, read that portion. This is how holy. I want to underline this. And I will finish with this, pl- this point. This is how holy it is to be a priest for God. I'm thankful that God doesn't work the same way in judgment. But judgment is God's strange work. What we need to learn from that portion, read Leviticus 10. What we need to learn from that is that God is holy. And as a priest, holy priest, a royal priest, as a priest that goes into God's presence, my life needs to be consecrated. My way of worship needs to be in keeping with His holiness. All that I do needs to be according to the mind and will and way and word of God. When it's not, God will step in. and God will say as He did in Corinth, listen, I'll take some of you home. God will step in as he did in those churches in Ephesus, or those churches in Revelation 2 and 3. I may just have to blow on it, and I may have to close the door. This is how serious God takes his holiness. I believe we've lost sight of it. I believe we need to come back to it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Maybe a brother could close in prayer. They are bringing before our eyes the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that all of us here this evening will be able to come into your, your very presence by the Holy Spirit to see the Lord Jesus who prepared our salvation when he died and prepared our justification when he rose again. Father, we pray that the young people here and the older ones will be priests who come into your very presence to praise and give thanks and go out to the world around us in these last days before the coming of the Lord and Savior and bring before the eyes of other people who are around us the salvation and the love of Christ, the love of God. Father, we give thanks for all these wonderful, beautiful pictures which you brought before our eyes in these meetings. Father, we pray that that your word will work in our hearts, young and old, and that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit.
Father, we pray in the wonderful, the worthy, and the precious 